the film today is for the Centre for Kent History and Heritage's History Weekend. This is going to be our sixth weekend, although we lost one with 2020 and COVID. And today we're looking at Tudors and Stuarts History Weekend 2021. So what, what's been a really important part of the History Weekends has been the walks around Canterbury to actually give an idea of people being in Canterbury rather than, in a sense, um, just anywhere. So to try and bring this to our virtual weekend, we are actually having a couple of films for the weekend. And we are very fortunate that Paul Bennett, who is a visiting professor at Canterbury Christchurch University in history, in the Centre for Kent History and Heritage, and he's also just uh, recently retired as the director of Canterbury Archaeological Trust, is going to be guiding you around the centre of early Tudor Canterbury. Okay, well, we're standing in Butter Market or Bull Stake that was the principal, the most important public open space in Tudor Canterbury, as it had been since the seventh century. Two important streets meet here. A processional way from Worthgate and Burr Street that defines the inner Burr of the Anglo-Saxon town. And it's here at the intersection of those two streets that we've got this place of congregation on the southwest corner of the inner Burr that becomes a place of congregation, a place of assembly, a place of uh, ceremonial, uh, uh, a place of celebration, and a place of protest for over 1400 years. Adjoining the butter market, the bull steak, to the south, of St. Saviour Christ Church was a major lay cemetery. It was there from at least the middle of the 8th century. To the north of the market was an east-west street and giving access to a gate that gave access in turn to the cemetery and the precinct. The gate has been lost. We don't know quite where it is. It's to the east of the present gate. And it's shown in Prior Wybert's waterworks plan of the cathedral precinct that dates to 1165. And at that time, it provided the only access from the town to the cemetery and to the precinct. A gate wasn't built in this position until 1201. The foundations of that gate were found when the rising bollards were put underneath the present gate. The gate itself may have looked a bit like Christchurch Gate. When only Cemetery Gate was here, the only major access into the Priory uh, was to the north, near North Gate, accessed by a burris the borough uh, and the Green Court Gate, uh, built by 1150. So once this gate is built, it defines this place. It defines the market, uh, it defines the buildings that surround the market as this singular place within uh, the early medieval town. So by 1201, the gate gives access to the priory, the cathedral, uh, it separates the jurisdiction of the monastery and the secular town. 
it gives access to uh, an internationally important cult centre of Thomas Beckett. It gives access to the third richest monastic house in Britain after Westminster and Glastonbury Abbeys. And it gives access to the Archbishop's Palace, the finest residence, one of the finest residences in the land at that time. By the late 15th century, this space was surrounded not only by the market, but by high-end houses, mainly timber framed, by lodgings and by inns, many of them built by Christchurch Priory for a commercial purpose. And most of them with retail under and lodgings over. In the center of the market was a tall cross built by John Coppin of Whitstable and William Big of Canterbury in 1446. Variously called Principal Gate and Church Gate, the first in 1501, the second in 1504, the gateway, the old gateway, gave on to the churchyard where four times a year a fair was held. One fair, Michaelmas Fair, survived right into the 19th century. So, in the Tudor period, the old gateway separated the monastic world and the secular world within the context of important retail space and looking out onto this populous and important marketplace and place of congregation within the town. So a, a gate was in this position from at least 1201. But by the late 15th century, it was an old gate. Uh, it wasn't a fine gate, like the gate built by Abbot Findon in 1301 for St Augustine's. A new gate on this side of the city was a long time coming. The gate behind me, we have few records for. They were destroyed in the Audit House fire of 1670. But we can be sure that the gate was built by um, Prior Goldstone II and completed by Prior Goldwell, the last Prior of Christ Church. We don't know when the work was started. We know that the Archbishop Morton gave money for the gate in 1500. And we know from the heraldry and the building of the gate that it was probably started sometime around 1509. The architect to the gate is also unknown or unclear. John Wastel was the master builder here in Canterbury at the time the gate was built. He died in 1517. But the work is not thought to be his. It's too elaborate. A man called Robert Virtue was living in Canterbury at that time. He had a relative at St Augustine's and worked for St Augustine's. And he may have had a hand in the building of the gate. The closest parallel, particularly for the decoration of this gate, comes from Henry VII's chapel at Westminster Abbey. And it's believed that Virtue had some hand in it. But Robert Virtue died in 1506 and was buried at St Augustine's. So it's unlikely to have been him. So we don't know who the architect was and we have no clear documentary evidence for when the work was started. The gate 
is of three stories, built on a ragstone base. Its fabric is of con stone, but the con stone obscures a core of brickwork, and the brickwork and the stone are tied together with iron clamps. Above the ragstone foundation are two apartments over the gate carriageway, one above the other. They're heated, they have chimneys and fireplaces, and there are pintles in the window openings for shutters. Both apartments are accessed via a, a, a vice, a spiral staircase, just through that door. The spiral staircase unusually has an integral Purbeck marble handrail that goes up the side of the vice. Normally these spiral staircases have no such device. All of this is under a very elaborate battlemented parapet flanked by octagonal turrets, one to the east and one to the west. To the north, above the carriageway, there's a plain parapet looking out onto South Close. The gate is elaborate. It's a riot of heraldry, of, of secular and religious motifs. At the lowest level, there are 15 Tudor badges and aristocratic badges decorating the south front of the gate. And this telling us of the relationship between the crown and the monks of Christ Church. To place these badges here meant that the king has allowed it. And it's the monks also depicting their relationship with, with the crown. Below that field of badges is a painted inscription stating that this gate uh, was constructed in the year of our Lord 1517. Well, the date is a conceit of W.D. Caro, who restored the, restored the gateway between 1931 and 37. Um, the inscription was very eroded, and he took it upon himself to put the date on the gate. The gate was in fact completed in 1520. Above the heraldry is another frieze of angels holding half angels, holding shields. And the shields bear the, the painted fictive religious charges of the instruments of Christ's passion. The frieze is interrupted by an elaborate niche with a canopy that held a statue of Christ under a dove for the Holy Ghost. The rest of the gate is extremely elaborate with a riot of foliage and figurative sculpture. Some of it extremely grotesque, but others beautifully modeled. High up in the gate, for example, is a mermaid with her hairbrush and mirror. And lower down over the point of the arch are other figures mixed in with the foliage. More importantly, between the portals are narrow, thin panels with arabesque decoration. They all form part of the original ornament and define the gate. In addition to all the minute detail, the heraldic shields, 
and the frieze of angels. There's other iconography related to Beckett and the builder of the gate, Goldstone II. And his shield can be seen over the pedestrian portal here behind me. The gate itself is square with two openings, the large carriageway and a pedestrian portal on the south front and then to the rear one large opening giving on to the south close. Above the gate hall is a stellar rib vault, Leon vault, with prominent highly decorated central boss and eight different charges, one of them of Goldstone the second uh, and one of them of Goldwell amongst others. In the west elevation of the gate chamber is the door into the vice that gives access to the chambers above. And also in the same elevation is a little seat, presumably for the gatekeeper or the porter to open and close the gate leaves. The gate was closed by massive timber door leaves, highly decorated and symbolic, open and closed to the sound of bells. Okay, the north front is, in com compared with the south front, very plain and unadorned with sculpture and ornament. The decoration mainly confined to the rear arch of the gate opening, to the string courses, and then there are three heraldic devices uh, at lower, middle, and upper level, all beneath a crenellated parapet. The doors have the arms of Juxon on this side and of Dean Taylor on the other. They were made by Edward Dale in London and shipped via from London to Faversham and then by road from Faversham to Canterbury. The Sun Inn was built by John Gonelm of Bury St Edmunds for Prior Molash between Easter 1437 and December 1438. We have the accounts for the building of the Sun in the Cathedral Archive and they provide us a great deal of detail. For example, we know that John Massingham III carved the sign of the sun in February 1437 and that John Daw painted the sign of the sun in March 1439. We have rentals for the building from 1438 to 1661 and throughout much of that period the building had three floors of accommodation over high-end shops. The model of the gate and the sun shows three garrets in the roof of the building each lit by a small dormer with a trefoil headed window. All three of those garrets were linked together by a parapet, uh, a balcony that looked out over the market. After 1617 the building was used as a tavern and there's a model of the gate and part of the Sun Inn of 1779 that provides us with quite a few additional details for the overall building. The Sun itself is 18.3 meters wide and 6.9 meters deep. It's timber framed throughout on two jetted floors with a garret above. It's divided into six bays. 
with three chambers at each level. So overall, the building has nine chambers, nine lodgings built within it, all over the top of ground floor shops and beneath the shops, a barrel vaulted chalk block cellar that runs for the length of the building. Access to the cellar is through a through passage that you can see on that side that runs into the sun yard. And within the yard, you have other outbuildings, but most specifically, a kitchen, buttery and pantry, all built in brick. There are nine chambers, all under a unique twin crown plate roof that still survives. The framing of the building at first and second floor is also surprisingly intact with internal partitions and door locations. There are two original second floor windows to the rear, plain, uh, um, with deeply cut spandrel spandrels. It's a remarkable survival. The building double jetted onto Butter Market was also jetted on this side. The jetty abutting a lane that ran from the market to this lost lane to the rear of the properties and eventually to Cemetery Gate. This jetty was destroyed in a fire in 1815 and the lane itself was built over in 1660 to 61 when this building was constructed. And so we turn now to the bull. The bull closes the eastern side of the butter market. There was a stone house here from at least 1200. And we hear again of that house in a, a fee farm document of 1234. And again in 1370, a rental tells us that the building was an inn called the White Bull. This building was constructed by Prior Goldstone the First. By 1468, we know that because the building appears in his obit and it's described as a multiple lodging built in timber called in English the Bull. The Bull is an enormous set of buildings. It fronts on to the Butter Market, it fronts on to Burgate, and it fronts on to what is now Butchery Lane. In the Tudor period, Butchery Lane was Sunwinds Lane and then Angel Lane. The inn itself had an internal courtyard and that was accessed from the lane. But the Butter Market elevation contained the most expensive high-end apartments. There were three apartments on each of two floors. Below those apartments were shops. The apartments were two bays wide and four bays deep. And over the top of this range was a double piled roof. It had two roofs. The apartments on this side had triple windows in each bay, and some of them you can see surviving here. To the rear, overlooking the yard, there were two windows to each bay, looking out into the yard. The upper suite of rooms, of lodgings, also enjoyed the 
area of the roof space. Here it must have been a crown post roof. So the, these high-end apartments were the best in the establishment and the most sought after must have been the ones at the corner that enjoyed so much light through these windows fronting onto the butter market and fronting onto Burgate. The high-end apartments overlooking the butter market enjoyed something that other apartments didn't. They had fireplaces and chimney stacks. They were heated. The front two bays of each lodging looked out over Butter Market and were probably unheated. There may well have been an internal partition that separated those front two bays from two bays for a heated room to the rear of each lodging. This made them extremely rare and very high-end. Underneath the shops are a set of cellars. Round the corner, one of the cellars probably relates to the original stone house and was reused when the Bull Inn was constructed by Goldstone I. Burgate Lane elevation uh, is also double jetted with chambers uh, or lodgings at both uh, levels, the, with shops under and cellars under. And you can see one cellar light at the pavement level over there. This undercroft, this cellar, is probably part of the original 13th century stone house. The, this range is two bays deep and the lodgings here would have had three windows to each bay giving on to Burgate Street and two windows to the rear giving on to the yard. So these two were fairly high-end lodgings, not quite as plush as the ones facing onto Burgate, but of some status. And again, the overall arrangement is shops over undercrofts with lodgings above. We're now looking down Butchery Lane at the third range of buildings for the Bull. These are of single jetty. So there's an apartment above, shops below. The apartments would have enjoyed the roof space um, as well. So the roofs would have, or the rooms would have gone right up to the apex of the roof, enjoying the whole volume of that space. At the end of the range, uh, on Butchery Lane, is the wagon entry leading into the inner courtyard. So there are three ranges here, three main ranges, containing at least 18 different apartments. Each range contained their own stairs and in origin they're very similar to the early Oxford and Cambridge colleges and the Inns of Court in London. They all developed from the same sort of route. The third medieval inn adjoining Butter Market was the Crown. Nothing survives above ground of this building, but below ground is a complex of undercrofts and cellars together with some timber scantling that are almost certainly parts of the Crown Inn. Not only have we not got anything above ground, but we've got very little documentary evidence to go with it, except for an obscure reference telling us that in 1535, there was a chamber in the Crown called the Sandwich Chamber. 
The greatest of Canterbury's pilgrim inns was the Checker of the Hope, behind me. This was built between 1392 to 5 by Christ Church Priory to accommodate pilgrims visiting the Shrine of Becket. The building is constructed on stone foundations, a whole ground floor of high-end shops with stone entrances, and then two floors of timber framing, 10,000 square feet on those two floors. This was an enormous building with two main ranges and then a central narrow courtyard with access from the high street via an ornate doorway. Half of the building still survives. The other half was destroyed in a fire in 1865. Underneath the range of shops and the stone shops were still here into the late 18th century are undercrofts and the undercrofts are lit with original windows still with all their original iron bar grillings. There's a huge amount of detail within the structure. It's got a wonderful set of crown post roofs. Many of its gallery windows still survive. The framework inside the building in part is still painted in ochre. It is remarkable at the upper levels and the further you go down through the building so changes in retail fashion have taken away elements of the original building. A significant number of details survive for this building, not least the dragon beam, returning the two jetties at the corner of the building, and then high up, original sank foil traceried head windows. The two surviving windows up there probably originally lit a single large room containing up to 50 individual beds. The facade, the front facade of the checker can be seen with its jetty and just around the corner is the entrance itself. The internal yard can still be seen and then the other half of the building, the mirror image of this half, was burnt in the fire of 1865. So it's, it is a remarkable survival and a remarkable building. But a pot always being half full rather than half empty, we have one of the finest pilgrim inns in the country still surviving here in Canterbury, just outside Christ Church Gate and outside the Butter Market. <laughs> So we've looked at some of the buildings that surround the butter market and they represent but a small number of surviving historic structures that survive in Canterbury. This is a remarkable place. The butter market as a place of congregation, as a place of celebration. And I did mention at the beginning it was also a place of protest and indeed a place of conflict as in 1647 when this place was uh, in riot uh, there was a bawdy football match performed here and there was civil riot throughout the town when Parliament tried to ban Christmas and force the market holders and the shopkeepers to open on Christmas Day. So I hope you've enjoyed this introduction to Tudor Canterbury and I hope that next year when the pandemic is over I can take you around and introduce you to Canterbury in person. <laughs>